Okay, I think we are getting ready to start. I can find. My PowerPoint. There we go. We're going to start with um, dentinal hypersensitivity, which is. Do I have the right chapters? And I do. Okay. Now, next week, what we have is a student uh, that's coming in, and she needs to do a live presentation. So uh, we will be doing um, we'll, we'll be doing a live course, I believe, next week. She and I are still getting together to see what uh, what we're going to be doing with that one. Again, even her course that's all online is being disrupted because she was supposed to be doing shadowing and that type of stuff. But dentinal hypersensitivity um, is something that uh, we are going to be discussing also yes. in DNH 146. I think you're not sharing your screen. Uh, I not... see my screen. Well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Let me see. What am I doing? Zoom. How about now? That's better. Works. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Um, uh, one time, well, I think it was with you all. I, I did an entire presentation, and when I went to try and post it on Blackboard, um, all you saw was the title. So I was sharing the wrong screen. So I just, instead of redoing it, I said, this is audio only. Because that's. Again, try and find um, the simplest way to do things and not be redundant um, because nobody's got time for that. All right, Hi dental hypersensitivity um, is something that we are going to be experiencing with our patients um, time and time again on a daily basis. So what you need to do is understand what the various theories are for dental hypersensitivity and what can you do to help eliminate some of the possible causes for your patients. And this is a theory that um, is pretty well standard across the, um, the board when it comes to what we think is causing the dentinal hypersensitivity, but new products are coming out all the time. I uh, was in a scientific session this weekend at, uh, with the Virginia Dental Hygienist Association, and instead of being in Richmond, it was in front of our computer, which was really nice, but uh, the speakers were from all over the country, and uh, one of them was on new products, and uh, a number of them were uh, ones for dental hypersensitivity, and again, new products are coming out. So it's important that you stay on top of what the literature has and your professional journals have. Talk to the sales reps when they come in and see what science is behind these new products before you get on board and see what works for, uh, for your patients because this isn't a one size fits all type of um, fix for patients. What works for some don't always uh, work for everybody else. So, uh, what is the um, hypersensitivity and what is it defined as? So, the stimuli that elicit um, dental hypersensitivity, now, you know from your histology and from your um, head and neck anatomy, the parts of the tooth and these channels that go in from the outside of the tooth to the inside of the tooth and that type of thing. So, remember your... Um, your anatomy when it comes to that, right? Because you've got your enamel that has the enamel rods, you've got your cementum with that outer layer of cementum that is supposed to be uh, protecting the inner dentin. And then you've got those dentinal tubules which go from the outer layer of the cementum all the way to the pulp chamber. 
and that is where that dentinal hypersensitivity comes from. Also remember what the picture was with uh, the enamel and where the cementa meets. You have a certain percentage where they meet at the CEJ. You have a certain percentage where the enamel overlaps the um, cementum a little bit. And then you've got that small percentage of people where there's a gap between where the enamel is and where the cementum is. And those are the patients that are going to uh, really be hypersensitive, even with probing. Uh, their gingival margin might be where it's supposed to be, and they, they have no recession that you can see. They don't have anything else going on. But if they are experiencing sensitivity, we have to say that it's real for them. So right now, <clears throat> the theory that is um, believed and it's been out for a long time is the hydrodynamic theory. And um, that is saying, let me see if there's a picture here, okay? That um, these dentinal tubules go to the outside. Now the root surface is here on this right side of the um, picture. Oops. The right side of the picture here. So you can see where the uh, tubules go from the nerve of the tooth, the center of the tooth, they come out to the root surface. And within these tubules, there is fluid. And this fluid maintains a balance. Whenever that fluid is disrupted, there's going to be some sort of sensation, hot sensation, cold sensation, hypersensitivity sensation. And it's that fluid balance, especially if you are familiar with whitening products, how some patients um, experience sensitivity during their whitening procedure. It's because the peroxide goes into those tubules, which take up that natural balance, the pH balance and the pluses and minuses of ions and all that other stuff, and disrupt that natural balance so the teeth then again become hypersensitive during whitening. Patients can have very sensitive teeth during dental procedures, even cleaning if they have their mouth open for a long time and the teeth become dehydrated. And uh, you've got that cold suction of the saliva ejector just sitting there by their tongue, even when you're, especially when you're using um, your hand instruments because in school, you're using your hand instruments for a long time, and the patient's got their mouth open so the teeth can dehydrate. That can create hypersensitivity as well. Gingival recession is one of the main causes. Now, with this, this um, these areas don't really show a big demarcation where the CEJ is. On the premolars here, you can see it. Premolar CEJ, premolar CEJ. Look at the wear here on this canine and on the central and lateral incisors. If you're doing a uh, gingival assessment with your eye, with the level of um, expertise that you have now, would you necessarily see that as recession? So sometimes it can fool you. And we sit down as faculty to uh, do a uh, perio assessment and you've missed areas. Don't beat yourself up. We are there to teach you um, how to look at things that you might not be seeing, all right? But look also on this canine, they've got thin attachment here. There might even be a mucogingival uh, defect depending on what that probe depth is. If this probes down to two millimeters, and from the CE, uh, from the gingival margin to the mucogingival line, if that's two millimeters, it's probably a um, mucogingival defect, right? And that's where your CAL comes in. Now, abfraction is one of these theories that came about in the 80s, and uh, there's still a little bit of controversy around them, but uh, it is pretty much accepted today. Abfraction is where the tooth flexes just a little bit at that CEJ area and the enamel rods crack and fracture off. Now, abfraction is usually more on the um, enamel portion of the tooth than it is on the root surface, but that is different from abrasion, right? 
they might look the same. One's a little saucer, one's a little uh, scooped out, versus another one is a strong V, right? But just with our occlusal surfaces, there's that little bit of microscopic flexing that can go on. Now this is what the dentinal tubules look like microscopically. You can see that it, they are openings. And each hole can transmit sensation. And with this, you can see those micro channels coming down too. So, um, these areas are open, it occurs all the time, and a lot of times our body can take care of things. One is um, this natural desensitization. Uh, one type of natural desensitization is chlorosis of the dentin, where it actually dies. So that outer opening just um, dies. So the nerve transmission doesn't go all the way to the outer area of the um, root surface. It stops just a little bit beforehand. We've got secondary dentin being uh, built up all the time, reparative dentin as well. Reparative is more due to trauma, but secondary dentin can also close those dentinal tubules. There's a smear layer where the, um, that outer layer just gets clogged up and our scaling, our aggressive scaling can take that smear layer off. And then calculus is a natural desensitization. Think about that bridge of calculus on the mandibular anterior. There might be recession there, but boy, they've got this cement-like structure that's saving those root surfaces from anything contacting it. So when you take that layer off, you have to predict that the patient might be sensitive after that. And then again, like we've um, said in other chapters, pre-plan that, give the patient some sensodyne or some desensitizing toothpaste, put on a fluoride varnish. Uh, we don't charge for the varnish. So uh, unlike private practice, you don't have to worry about it. Put the fluoride varnish on that newly exposed root surface just to help the patient. Who is the typical patient with um, hypersensitivity? Uh, some patients will experience a lot of sensitivity and you're scratching your head going, gee, I don't know why, they're just a, they're really wimpy. And other patients will have broken teeth uh, where you can see the nerve canal and uh, not have any sensitivity at all. So we really don't know who is going to experience sensitivity more, but generally it's uh, patients with recession. They have done studies and it's been documented that natural redheads experience more dental pain than non-natural redheads. And I have to put that natural part in there, but everybody's reaction to pain is different and our pain threshold is different as well. I'm always in awe with the patient that can go through a crown procedure and have all the enamel taken off the tooth and the dentin portion of the tooth shake to a certain uh, manner for a crown preparation and not need any anesthesia. There aren't many of them walking around there, but there are some. The only ones I've experienced have been met. I don't know what that says, but uh, that's my, my experience with it. So we have to do a differential diagnosis. We have to find out why the pain is there. Is it dentinal hypersensitivity? Is it caries? Is it another problem deeper within the tooth? Is it an endodontic situation? So that's one of the things that you do as a dental hygienist. You're, what, what's here, you know, why are you here today? Or do you have any problems going on with your mouth? Uh, it might require you to take a periapical of that tooth. It might require you to do an ice test or a cold test. They have, we uh, still use ice in my office because we're old fashioned, but they've got sprays that you can be putting on teeth. Now, um, there's something called a tooth sleuth that um, I have in my operatory where the patient can bite down on 
certain parts of a bite stick to see if there might be a hidden fracture that we can't see. Now, though, these are old investigative techniques um, that can be used. So we need to kind of figure out, is it heat? Is it cold? Is it both? Is it biting? Does it wake you up at night? And these are the uh, questions when a patient calls in with a chief complaint that the front desk has to ask as well. Do they, and they're overdue for a cleaning. So do they put you in with hygiene or do they put them in to, um, for a limited exam with the doctor's side of it? So we as dental hygienists need to be familiar with the techniques and the tests. And then depending on who our employer is and what they want us to be doing and what we want to be doing, we can then um, do a lot of this. Um, chair side before the dentist comes in. Sometimes the dentist wants to do it themselves just so they have a firsthand um, knowledge of what's going on. So what we would do is do preliminary testing and have other things out in case they want to do a pulp vitality test or something. We've got it ready just in case because for hygiene, those doctors are in our room for two to maybe five, six minutes and uh, they can't be sitting there waiting if they've got three or four other operatories that they're trying to manage with another hygienist and two patients in other chairs. Um, they need to be getting in and out as fast as possible. So the more that we can have things ready for them, um, the better they like us. So we are doing, um, we're doing assessment components. We're asking the patient, uh, if it is this quote-unquote standard uh, desensitization, and I'm getting texted, excuse me. Uh, okay, yeah, they're trying to change a meeting from uh, this afternoon to this morning. Um, so we are doing the assessment. The doctor can be doing the assessment. We are doing a lot of the educational considerations. Is it root surface sensitivity? What can we do? What do we have in our arsenal? to help these patients. Now, sometimes we need to do a pre-procedure polish with certain medicaments, uh, the MI paste with the amorphous calcium phosphate or the Novamin products or doing something else. Um, Boco has some really nice um, fluoride varnishes that can go on that uh, don't require light, but they, they stay on the tooth. It, it, there's a lot of different uh, products out there that we can do before a procedure. Um, there's also um, things that we can do. We're going to start with the desensitizing toothpaste. And then if that doesn't work, this is the treatment hierarchy, then we can bring you back and we can put Gluma or another product on the root surface. And if that doesn't work, we can put um, something else on the root surface. And then finally is doing a, um, some sort of a restorative procedure. To cover that up. Are things working? Are they not? Desensitizing toothpaste take two weeks to work. So um, we, it's not a, a one-time fix. So these patients that are hypersensitive that are coming in to the um, practice oftentimes needs to be reminded if they're not using a desensitizing toothpaste with the potassium nitrate in it all the time to two weeks before they come in to see you, they need to start using the desensitizing paste. And they need to use it every day, twice a day for two weeks. And sometimes that's enough to get them through the appointment. And then of course the sensitivity goes away and they stop using their toothpaste and get with something that they like better. Um, so you gotta see what works for the patient. Um, oral hygiene care and treatment interventions, uh, understanding the mechanisms of desensitization. Uh, some will block the dentinal tubules, will cover them up and block them. Some will um, create a plus and minus deionization going on in there and uh, with the pluses and the minuses of those ions to depolarize. Uh, sometimes you have to also see what is being created in that mouth to cause those type of um, sensitivity issues. Behavioral changes. 
Uh, it only hurts when I do this, and the patient's got their fingernail right at their CEJ, or they're sensitive to sweets or sensitive to hot. Those type of things, we might be able to get some behavioral changes to uh, have them stop eating the acetic foods or that type of thing. Uh, desensitizing agents, there are a number of them out there. And again, what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for the next. So that's why we have to have a multifactorial uh, way of um, intervening with these uh, hypersensitive patients. Some of them, the patient can be doing at home. Fluoride trays. Stannous fluoride is a product that's being put in toothpaste again. Um, that is wonderful. It's bactericidal, where it is good for the gum tissues, as well as uh, for dental caries and for hypersensitivity. Stannous fluoride is really a wonderful fluoride, but it's got that tin ion that can stain teeth, and it doesn't taste very good. So the newer products have been able to mask and uh, alleviate the staining for that. There are professionally applied measures. Every office is going to have their couple of uh, go-tos that work for them. Uh, part of the thing is, is it easily applied? Some of them require a curing light and isolation for you to be able to use them. That requires more time. So we're looking for something that can be easily done chair side. Um, and then the additional considerations uh, are, if nothing else works, what else can we do? I have seen patients that have gone through crowns because the tooth was so sensitive and that just covered everything up. Uh, there are the outliers that also need to um, have root canals because there's, there's nothing else has worked. And it depends on the degree of sensitivity that the patient's experiencing. Are they having to alter their lifestyle because of this um, sensitivity? Um, so again, you need to rule out things. I had one patient that came in with sensitivity. I thought it was root surface sensitivity. I took bite wings. I told you this story. Did not get the distal of their terminal molar and uh, on the bite wing and didn't see anything. I thought it was root surface. And then he came back. I put some desensitization on, gave him some sensodyne. He came back. It was still uncomfortable for him. I ended up taking um, an additional image at that time and there was decay there that was missed because it was the distal buckle of 16 i still remember it and we didn't get i didn't get it in the bite wing so we weren't able to visualize it and the explorer of course is very difficult to get in and feel that so that was a my bad situation so when the doctors say they want the distal of the canine and the distal of the terminal molars on their bite wings they mean it and there's a reason for it and again, you're going to document, document, document uh, the teeth involved. The, um, sometimes it's one tooth, sometimes it's more teeth, sometimes it's not even the tooth the patient thinks they, um, they, that, that hurts. It's kind of a transient type of thing. The differential diagnosis that you performed, you did the pulp testing, you did this, you did that, the ice test. Um, and the treatments and what did you give the patient to help alleviate that and then again you want to have the follow-up so sometimes the follow-up is just a phone call or have them call us it's always best if you call the patient because you're not relying on them to remember to call and uh, it just makes them feel even more special so um we are also teaching the patient what's going on in their mouth. All right, so some of this is the oral hygiene self-care techniques uh, using the desensitization um, toothpaste. The box of the toothpaste states, do not use this more than two weeks without consulting your dental professional. If pain still exists, consult your dental professional. And that is just their disclaimer because we don't want a patient getting one of these products and using it thinking that it's going to um, decrease the sensitivity. And it's not because of um, the typical dental hypersensitivity 
reaction. They have decay or they've got a, a root canal therapy issue that needs to be um, addressed, something like that. So there's always that catch on these products. It doesn't mean that the patient can't be using a toothpaste for the rest of their life, okay? If that, if that has been deemed the rationale for them using that toothpaste, there's no harm in that. Uh, toothpaste now have an all-in-one also. Um, the, the totals uh, now use a, uh, the Colgate total, no longer uses triclosan, it's using a stannous fluoride. So that's good for your gum health, your desensitization and um, everything else. So uh, the, the toothpaste are incorporating potassium nitrate and the stannous fluoride technologies to help these patients. So they don't need to just use this for sensitivity and this for gum health. It's got everything. Uh, no toothbrushing after consumption of um, acetic foods or beverages. Patients think that after they eat or drink something that's cavity causing, these sugar bugs are going to be eating their teeth. So go brush your teeth right away. Well, if you think about it, that pH is lowered. The enamel and the root surface is more susceptible because of that critical pH. And then you're going to be applying an abrasive toothpaste and or a toothbrush to these root surfaces that might be exposed. So you have more of a risk of wearing away that cemental layer if you brush right afterwards. So it's better to let that pH get back to a normal level, either through swishing with fluoridated water, eating cheddar cheese, or just the time period of it, and then they can brush. Um, the same way after uh, vomiting or uh, the GERD, you know, the gastric reflux coming up, we want that pH to, uh, and the buckling of the saliva to take care of things before uh, we start brushing. So even rinsing with some baking soda water is good. Uh, challenges for managing hypersensitivity um, are, are great, especially when they come in for their routine uh, cleanings with you. I have had patients that have needed and wanted nitrous oxide just for the cleaning. Uh, and they didn't need anesthesia, they just needed something to take the edge off. Um, so their pain threshold and their tolerance was better and they could deal with the, uh, the issues. I had an employer's wife who had third molars extracted uh, when her husband was in um, dental school and there was some nerve damage to the um, uh, mandibular nerve and that area on that side of the tooth, the mouth was always so hypersensitive. Uh, we hooked her up on nitrous though and uh, you were able to scale like um, almost as if there wasn't any hypersensitivity there. So you'll know these patients uh, and you'll be having them in your chair every day. If you try and even use that psycho sedation that we talked about with the, the anesthesia, allow the patient, hear the patient, don't let them think that you're, you know, don't let them see you rolling their eyes. Oh my gosh, it's Mr. Smith or, or Mrs. Smith. Um, and try some of the techniques of psycho sedation, even pre polishing with something. We have the Tons of Maine toothpaste that's in the clinic that has the arginine in it because Colgate had a wonderful product to use prior to scaling that they took off the market because it wasn't one of their uh, money makers. But uh, Colgate also uh, owns Tons of Maine. It's really the same formulation. Uh, have the patient brush with that prior to um, the appointment or you polish with the rubber cup. Um, with that toothpaste, it's not for biofilm removal, but then they think you're doing something, you're trying to do something, and the two combined might be able to help that patient um, have a better outcome for your scaling. It's very difficult to scale patients when you have to um, peel them off. They levitate up to the uh, off the chair, and you have to keep peeling them down to get their their bottoms back on the chair. Okay, so that is um, hypersensitivity. Are there any questions?
do know the theory of the hydrodynamic theory that is going to creep up with you on your boards as well. Are there, um, has anybody, what do your offices do um, that uh, we didn't discuss? I know that there were the electro tests. Um, anybody use the ice test or anything else that they'd like to share? All right, we are going to stop this share. Uh, and I'm going to stop.